one. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for Thursday, September 17th, 2020. In accordance with the mandated direction of the State Superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting, despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Um, Ms. Pastor? Uh, present, yes. Ms. Mack? Ms. Mack? Yes, I'm present, sorry. Mr. Mahamza? You're muted. You're muted. Can't. We can't hear you. I think he's frozen. Okay, well, Mr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Present. And Dr. Hager? Present. Thank you. Is Mr. Mahamza still frozen? I think so. I don't see him anymore. Yeah, he left the meeting. He was okay. Thank you. He's probably going to check back in. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Please call the roll of staff members participating in today's yeah. meeting. Dr. McComas. Present, and I also, Ms. Cox, Mr. Mahomesma is back with us. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can, we hear, can you. hear you. Thank you. Dr. Adams? Present. Mr. Imbrielli? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Pirandozzi? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cox, are there any other staff members participating in this meeting or any other members of the board who have not responded to this point? Well, um, staff members, we have um, Mr. David Dovenauer. Yes, I'm here. Mr. John Billingsley. And Cox, Dr. Dan. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, this is um, Megan Shea. Um, I think it's possible some staff might be joining later because later. of the time on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we do anticipate Dr. Billingsley to be on Correct. and Dr. Danny Colley. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. as well as Miss Jennifer Kraft from ELA will join us um, to participate I'm, in that conversation. I'm here. Oh, hi, Ms. Kraft. Hi. <laughs> um, and I'm also pleased to say we have a phenomenal teacher joining us uh, when we go through the grade eight social studies. Um, our, one of our teachers, Miss Brianna Ross, well, I don't know if she's here yet, but she will join us. Oh, okay. Thank you. We will announce, additionally, we'll announce each, each um, the presenting team for each presentation as we go. Thank you. Thank you all. And I thank those of you who are present and welcome to all. Dr. McComas, I'm going to turn this over to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pasture and members of the, the committee. So uh, today we uh, flipped our agenda. We are um, bringing our approval items forward first um, so that we don't run out of time. As we know, we have robust discussions out and often run right up to our, our the next committee that's starting. So I'm going to ask Shay to come forward and share with you um, information on um, two contract items that you will be coming up in October meeting, you know, we're always trying to be in front so that we can um, share with you what you can anticipate seeing from our shop and um, what those things are instructionally and how they support our students. So, Ms. Shea. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. McComas, is the presentation going to be displayed or do you want me to display it? I didn't know if Mr. Corns had it and was going to display it centrally or if you would like me to do it. One second, Ms. Shea. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Corns. Um, so I'll just start talking just in the interest of time to explain. We have two instructional materials that will be coming forward. The first is a, an actual contract that already exists, but it does ask for an increase in spending authority. And this is about our instrumental, our, our instrument rental and repair and cleaning. And so, as you know, and we've talked before, um, as part of our phenomenal award-winning music program, we do have a an inventory of BCPS owned instruments that we lend out to students. Um, so some families do um, rent instruments directly from a vendor, other students use instruments that are part of BCPS's inventory. And so it is a process that we go through each year um, to have instruments sent out over the summer for cleaning and repair. Um, next slide, Mr. Corns. And so this year we do have an increased cost um, really because of the number of instruments um, due to COVID. And what I mean by that is not because the cleaning is necessarily different. However, um, because of the virus, we did take the added precaution of sending all of our inventory for repair and cleaning. So you can see the increase in the number. Those are the two approved vendors that we use. Menchie Music and Music and Arts. Um, so we're bringing forth this contract to request that increase in spending authority so that we can complete those instrument clean, cleaning requests and repair and make sure that we have all of our instruments in good and working order. Um, just a note about instructionally, we are starting our instrumental music classes virtually. Our teachers are amazing and our curriculum teams work to provide shifts in lessons for how they can begin some of the instruction before we're able to get instruments um, in students' hands, but we do anticipate being able to while we're still in a um, virtual setting, once the instruments have been cleaned and repaired, we will have an additional distribution to make sure we get them in the hands of students. Next slide, please. The other contract that is coming forward from the Office of Music and Dance, this is a new contract. So as we have shared before, again, as part of our award winning music and dance program, um, we have had a really phenomenal increase in interest in dance programs in our middle schools, which is very exciting. And so in order to maintain um, our high quality instructional program for dance, we do have a multi-year strategic plan to be able to expand dance program offerings in schools. And so typically what happens is we have a multi-phase approach where we begin by introducing a program in a school so that we can gauge interest and see how many students want to participate. And then once we know we have that sustainability and there is interest and support, we want to make sure that we have an instructional environment that supports that. Um, so this contract is going to allow for us to continue that um, multi-year strategic plan to be able to expand um, dance offerings. You can see there the um, seven schools that have been identified as immediate needs. 
many middle schools, and then we do have Kenwood High School. Um, you can see on the right-hand side what we're talking about. Um, the particular flooring is really designed, again, for that high-quality instruction, but also for the safety of the student dancers and teachers to make sure that um, they have the correct spring step flooring um, for their dance program. So these are the two contracts that will be coming in October from the Department of Academics, and I'm ready for any questions you might have. Are there any questions from the members? Yes, this is Lisa Mack. Um, Ms. Shea, as far as the dance floor, are there any schools in the Southwest area that currently have um, this type of floor? I'm sure there are, Ms. Mack. I don't have that list in front of me, but I'll absolutely get it for you and send it as a follow-up with Dr. McComas. With the new schools that were built, oh no, they would be elementary schools, never mind. Right. I'll and get you I, the exact list so you can see the specifics. Off the top of my head, I want to say Pikesville, but I don't want to be wrong, so I'm going to double check myself and send that to you. And then my other question is, is this a permanent floor? Yeah, like, that's is my it, understanding. It gets put down and it stays where it is. It's not yes. movable. Okay. Because there is an installation that goes with it. So, yes, that's my understanding. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Ms. Shea, you mentioned Pikesville. Pikesville is uh, northwest. I think Ms. Um, Mack asked about the southwest. But I Pikesville, apologize. Thank you. But Pikesville <laughs> Middle does have a floor. Such yeah, a so it'd still be close to go peek at it if you wanted to see it. But, yes, yeah, I will get a yeah. specific response for southwest. Thank yeah. you, Ms. Pester. And close to you as well, Ms. Mack, uh, Milford. Mill has one as Thank well. Thank you. Okay. Any, uh, Mr. Mahomes, I saw your hand up. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to ask. So when I was at uh, Deep Creek about like four years ago, um, they during like my gym class they introduced. Uh, I believe it was like I think it was like the dance team or something. Like I think it was step, and they used to do the dance with like the sticks. Is that the program you said that they introduced? in order to gauge um, students' interest? Yeah, so there's a couple things that you're talking about. So within um, our, th thank you for the question, Mr. Hamza. So um, we do have within our PE classes, we have some dance curriculum that we do in the elementary and middle program just around exposure. This is actually would be for having it as an elective um, course. So the same way students can enroll in music or art, um, they would be actually able to take a dance class. So when we go to put the actual flooring in, it's because the school has made the commitment that we're going to hire a dance teacher and we're going to actually teach that as one of the special area courses. So what you may be referencing um, could be a part of that program, but there is also um, some dance curriculum that we use on a rotation throughout our elementary schools. You may remember seeing things like ballroom dancing. I'm sure you'll get invited yeah. in the spring <laughs> and see pictures. Um, that's more a universal to gauge that interest, but this is actually when we would have the instruction aligned to those standards as a um, recurring course. Okay. And so like, cause uh, that program that was at Deep, uh, Deep Creek Middle, it was like, they do competitions. So with this dance program, is there gonna be like competitions or something or it's just solely just a school thing? So within the actual um, curriculum and instruction program, some schools do also have it as an extracurricular um, where students participate outside of school. So it's not necessarily that um, all programs um, engage in those activities that you described, but some do. But that would be considered usually more of an after school mm -hmm. activity that sometimes is connected. Um, this, they do, however, participate in our showcases that we offer um, at the county. We have dance showcases where we have opportunities for students in magnet and non-magnet programs to be able to showcase their um, learning through performances. Okay. Okay. And lastly, um, where would like the installation occur? Is it going to be in the gym or like those recreation places? <laughs> No, usually they've identified a, a specific instructional space, a classroom space. So the dance expansion, the multi-year program plan that I described, um, the Office of Music and Dance developed in coordination with facilities and with the school based partners. So there's usually an identified um, space in the classroom, and then they um, install this um, flooring in that instructional space. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, Ms. Mack, hot up the presses. I did check that Lansdowne High School has it, and then we're checking for additional classes to let you know. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes, Dr. Hager. Hey, thank you. I um, I was going to ask the same question about that Josh asked about classroom space, and, and related to that, is this a space then that would be jointly used by Rec and Parks for programming at these schools? 
That's a really good question, Dr. Hager. It's not been my experience that that's necessarily a one for one, but I can certainly find out if that has ever been the case and get back in on that. How about costs? If there could be a joint use, joint cost. Sure, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question and one I can take back to the team for a clarification and then follow up with Dr. McComas to let you know. Thank you. Are there any of are there any other questions? And can I get a motion for this to approve? So moved, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Second. Ms. Pastor, can we do the contracts separately? Right. There's two okay, separate sure. ones, the instruments uh -huh. and then Ab the dance floor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank All right, you. let's do one. Uh, let's do the instrumental music, please, Ms. Uh, may I get a, a motion for the cost for the instrumental music instrument? So, so moved, Offerman. So redundant. Okay. Second, Offerman. I mean, second, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're having a good time this afternoon. Let me get my mouth together first. And we get a motion for the purchase of the instrumental music it's instruments. <laughs> it's for the cleaning. Oh, cleaning, yes, for the cleaning of the instrumental music. Thank so you, Ms. Mack. So moved, Mac. Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Can I get a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. All in favor, please. Oh, I have to do the roll call. I'll do a roll call, yes. <laughs> Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Then that um, has passed. And Dr. McComas, you thought it was going to be quicker this way? Okay. It's all in the mouth. All right. I'd like now to get a motion, please, to accept uh, the flooring, the cost for the flooring at the six schools, I can't, yes, for the seven schools identified in the presentation. So there, moved, Mac. Is there Thank you, Ms. Mac. Sorry, is the request to, is the motion to get a, a, a bid for this or because there's no amount? No, no, so. no, they've already they showed us. No, this is um, uh, for the seven schools to okay. get the flooring. If right. I may, if I just may, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, Dr. Hager, just um, would this is not serve as contracts committee, contracts committee, when you get the contract exhibit, as you um, always do in the board docs, you'll see the details of, of that. This is really about um, what is needed for the, it's, it's from the instructional side, I guess is what I'm saying, not from the, the contract negotiation side. Dr. McComas, can you take a few minutes and explain to Dr. Hager because um, why, why we don't include the dollar amount? Because when I came new to the curriculum committee, as yes. you recall, I asked the same question and right. she might find that helpful. Yes, absolutely. Because I can see how it's, you know, that it, um, Dr. Hager, if you think about the committees, they each, each committee has a particular purpose. Our purpose on curriculum committee is to understand the instructional programming and the resources needed to support the instructional program. And so that's really the lens of approval that we're looking at here today. So we try to present, you know, if this is an instructional material, here's um, the purpose of how it fits into the instructional program and why we need it um, and how that's implemented. So for example, here we're sharing the seven schools that uh, we need to um, over time put dance floors in. Um, the contracts committee, their purpose of course is for all of you to exercise that financial uh, lens and that financial uh, review. But think about the committees as working in a check and balance process, right? We try not to bring anything to contracts committee that we haven't already taken time to discuss with all of you so that you understand instructionally what it is, why it's needed, and then how it is we would implement it. So I hope in a brief summary that sort of gave you a sense of how these committees work in orchestration, serve as check balances to one another, and how um, when we look at a committee, we're really kind of looking at what's sort of the mission and purpose of that particular committee, and we sort of tighten our lens. I hope that was helpful. 
It was. It was. I think in the, we often see dollar figures, so not seeing yes. one kind of threw me threw me for a loop. So I appreciate that. Yes, and and I, you know, it's one of those things. I try to walk a fine line to uh, support your informed understanding, but then I also have to be mindful that my role, our role here, is not contract <laughs> negotiation. If I try to provide you meaningful understanding, so that when you're in that committee looking with that lens, or as the full board, you you sort of have, you know, what does this boil down to? Because I know often we look at um, exhibits and they're huge dollar amounts. And I often will try to um, help you understand what does this mean per pupil cost, for example, because then you can say, oh, for, you know, $25 each child. But then when you think about a system of 150000 it kind of helps put in perspective sometimes the, the figures that um, we deal with in the scale of our school system. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. My Dr. pleasure. Thank Dr. you, Ms. Dr. Hager. Uh, but also know that there are times that they bring things to us that do have to go to contracts, but this is different. So thank you. So now can I get a second on Ms. Mack's motion, please? Second, second Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, Ms. Cox, for roll call vote, please. Yes. Ms. Pastor? Uh, yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. And Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. And that also passes. Uh, Dr. McComas, I'm going to turn it back to you for the next item, please. Yes, ma'am. Um, and thank you, everyone, um, for... Um, our previous segment uh, around instructional materials. Um, so we're moving on to really our instructional part of our committee where we like to make sure that we're helping you understand all the things that we're doing to support um, our students instructionally in the many, many programs that we have. So our next item will be our English language arts curriculum audit update. And while um, they're bringing up the slides, I will just share for um, our new members of our committee um, Baltimore County, um, the year before last, had the opportunity to, um, well, we, based on our data, we knew that we need to audit our curriculum. And we began with math because of the urgency. And in the meantime, um, we were fortunate that MSCE that first year was not able to support us in the math audit because they were working for schools that were in comprehensive school support. However, they have worked through that uh, work at the state level, and they are now able to support us in auditing our ELA curriculum. And I'm very excited about this because our audits are an important process to help us ensure that the, the resources that we have in place for students and teachers are, in fact, uh, strongly aligned to the standards and any areas that we need to improve. These audit processes help us identify those and help us to continue to kind of that continuous improvement process that Dr. Williams always talk to that. Um, and so I won't belabor that. I'll turn it over to Ms. Shea and Ms. Kraft. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, next slide, Mr. Barnes. So um, as Dr. McComas said, the um, audit not only is a part of our um, school system's commitment to a cycle of continuous improvement, but it is a part of revised uh, the Code of Maryland regulations that we lovingly refer to as COMAR. And so I just wanted to take a moment to walk through the options. Um, so the regulation stipulates that every local school system provide evidence that our curriculum aligns to state standards in English language arts and math. And so the first option is um, for the MSDE itself to do the vetting, and then they produce a report that demonstrates that the reviewed curricula has earned that rating the way Dr. McComas described. Another option is to provide a curriculum vetting report produced by a nationally recognized external party. Um, and so as um, Dr. McComas shared, that was the option that we had employed, you'll remember, with Johns Hopkins for our math curriculum. Um, and then option three is that local school systems can provide documentation of national ratings of alignment for any third party curricula and curriculum support materials. So that would be appropriate, again, in terms of like, for example, our Bridges math curriculum 
um, were able to provide that um, report from Ed Reports as well. So for ELA, we are going to be uh, utilizing option one. MSDE did identify school districts in a rotating sort of phased-based approach for this process. Um, and so they have a few published reports. I know, for example, Baltimore City has already completed this process. So we um, began this process um, last year, probably just prior to our closure for COVID. Um, so next slide, Mr. Corns. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what that will look like. So this is a timeline of the process as it relates to MSDE. So you can see as it's laid out here, it's a pretty lengthy process. And Dr. McComas thought it would be important for us to share with this curriculum committee exactly um, the different steps that MSDE will be taking, because I know sometimes we'll hear, oh, we're having a curriculum audit and we'll want results, especially as we're thinking about things like um, budgets and instructional materials. So I wanted to be sure that I was able to provide an understanding of how MSDE's timeline will work. Um, so again, this is from their perspective. So they work for several um, months, you can see, in what they call pre-vetting, which is really about um, developing trained curriculum vetters so that they do hire Maryland teachers and people from across the LEAs um, to participate in this, but then they ensure that there's rigorous training to make uh, to try to ensure inner rater reliability as they're vetting it. And then the 60-day window in light blue of vetting curriculum is actually the time that they are working through our curriculum using MSDE developed rubrics with Ms. Which Ms. Kraft is going to go through in, in just a moment. And then once they um, develop or finish with those rubrics, then they, those reports are reviewed by content experts within the Maryland State Department of Education. So that might involve some back and forth. Um, sometimes in this process, there is uh, communication with us to ask for clarification or ask for additional resources before we get to the part of um, they write their report, then it's submitted for review. And then finally, it comes to us with recommendations. And so you can see that the process is quite detailed um, and, and really well laid out by the State Department of Education. And so next slide, please. What um, is really important to understand in terms of what we mean by the vetting um, so it's approximately 20 to 25 percent of the curriculum, and that's really important because um, I know from personal experience, sometimes that's hard because the um, those that are vetting the curriculum don't necessarily have access to the breadth and depth of all that we provide for our teachers. Um, so they choose, though, in a random sampling, what 20 to 25 percent they review. So we are actually responsible for providing access to the curriculum in its entirety, um, which we have done. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then the second thing I already mentioned, that it's Maryland educators um, from both the school systems and local colleges and universities. Um, they have to go through a process to be selected um, that demonstrates that they have a high level of expertise um, with the standards themselves and with curriculum and then they wind up going through that training that we outlined. Um, and then the important part um, on the bottom is that we have engaged in a collaborative process with MSTE to make sure that we provide them that access. So there's a variety of different ways um, that we can provide access. We were able to provide access through our learning management system in Schoology so that they would be able to see not only those um, core resources such as Open Court or Wonders, but also the curriculum materials um, that have been developed by our teachers. Next slide. So I'm going to introduce today, I think it's her first time at this committee, our Director of English Language Arts. Many of you will remember that uh, we didn't have one for some time, so I'm very happy to introduce Ms. Jennifer Kraft, our Director of ELA. She's been with us um, since, I want to say January, but my time has flown in this closure. Um, and so Ms. Kraft will talk a little bit about the rubrics and sort of how the process looks um, as it gets into detail. So Ms. Kraft? Yes, yeah, thank you, Ms. So the rubrics for uh, the curriculum vetting, um, actually um, there's four different ones because K1 and 2 have different rubrics and then all of 3 through 10 use the same rubric. And so there are four main components no matter which level the rubric is. They're looking at alignment to the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards. They're looking for evidence of key shifts. They're looking at um, what instructional supports are available to build proficiency and independence. And then they're also looking at assessment design and purpose. 
And K1 and 2, in addition to those four criteria that I just discussed, they're also looking at foundational reading skills. And so they're really looking at CCR anchor standard 2 and 3. And so it's very specific to make sure that we have that included in our curriculum. Um, and so based on the curriculum, as you can see on the slide, then they will assess how well they think that we met each of those criteria. So they can give us a four, which means that they, they really see that strong connection um, all the way to a zero where they don't feel like it meets the criteria. Um, next slide. So um, July 29th, we met with um, MSDE uh, where they outlined the expectations uh, what they should expect from them and what we should uh, they could expect from us. And then they gave us um, a deadline of submitting our curriculum by September 15th. Um, and our curriculum has already gone in um, for review and has been received. So we're uh, ahead of the ahead of that. So um, that's where we are with um, our key dates. Next slide. So any questions about the process? Thank you, Ms. Kraft. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Ms. Kraft, and welcome. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Kraft or Ms. Shea? I will okay, just great. add, thank um, just <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ms. Kraft, thank you, Ms. Shea. I will just add for the overall um, help of the conversation to, that all of us as in our instructional leader roles as board members and, and um, practitioners within the organization, um, we are anticipating this report to come to us in um, late April, early May, just so that you have a ballpark. So there's going to be, you're going to have, um, it's, it will be quiet. We won't have a lot of updates. Um, until we get to the spring semester. Just so you have a sense, I know Ms. Shea and in the uh, PowerPoint showed you the sort of sequence and it gave you chunks of this typically may take 30 days or this may take 60, 60 days in this phase of the process. But just to let you know, you may not hear very much about this until the second semester and we don't anticipate you know, that final report until late in the spring. I see Ms. Mack, do you have a question? You know, I wasn't gonna make it without a question, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. So we often hear from our friends at Decoding Dyslexia that some of the various um, programs we use to teach reading and phonics um, don't go hand in hand, like Fontes and Pinnell and Open Court. Would that type of thing, is that something that would be looked at in this audit? So thank you for the question, Ms. Mack. Um, Fontes and Pinnell is actually not a program we use for teaching phonics. Open Court is, as you mentioned, um, our systematic and explicit phonics program. And thanks to uh, the support of the board, we were able this year to roll that out to second and third. So it is the core phonics program for the systematic explicit phonics instruction in grades K through three. So because it is our core phonics program, that will be a part of what they review as part of this vetting process. And then in addition to that, they will look at our core series wonders, and they will also look at the curriculum materials, the scope and sequence, and the sample lessons that we have written ourselves to supplement and support the teaching of the standards. But because we, we do still use Fontes and Pinnell, is that a correct statement? Yes, yeah, so Fondas and Pinnell is, um, we have the benchmark assessment system. It's not really curriculum. So Fontas and Pinnell is an approach for how we do um, assessment of reading through listening to children read and using um, text to track and mark their errors and identify those errors um, using coding to identify whether the errors are with meaning or with an approach to phonics. And then we use the results of those assessments to help guide small group instruction. So it's um, the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment system is a part of our um, assessment tools that we provide for teachers. Um, however, in a current note, I will say we are not using them this fall right, 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 um, I know that. Right. Mm -hmm, because they had not been vetted in the current environment. So are um, we it's using dibbles, is that correct? I'm sorry. Yes, we are using dibbles. dibbles. We are using dibbles as part of the ready to read act to ensure that we have a high quality screener for those early literacy skills as required. 
Um, so back so, to one of the comments you made. So sure. uh, thank you for the clarification. So using sure. open court and wonders, mm -hmm. is, is it possible that they could come back and say these are two programs um, but we recommend not using them together. Is it that type of thing? It's a great question. So we haven't necessarily, we've been able to see an example of other reports. What my understanding, and Ms. Kraft can certainly chime in, what they will do is tell us whether or not the programs or the materials we're using meet the expectations of the standard. So for example, if in fourth grade, our curriculum references using the Wonders Word Study to try to meet the expectation of a foundational skill standard in fourth grade, the audit could come back and say, yes, this resource does meet the rigor of the expectation standard or no. It is not my expectation that they will provide us too much feedback about the design of how we support resources, but rather how the resources in our curriculum either do or do not meet the rigor expected in the standards. So they're not essentially evaluating the resource in and of itself. Right. So typically for published third-party resources, they're relying on um, other evidence-based reports that have been published. So I mentioned before they had referenced they often use Ed Reports, which is an independent third-party evaluator that does publish reports. So oftentimes that's what they will look to for the actual resources themselves. Um, but they will look to see how the curriculum documents that we've written and provided for teachers um, either meet the standard. And they will also give us feedback about things like our scope and sequence, um, the clarity of of how we're supporting the expectations of the standards, which may include feedback about how those resources are referenced. Um, we saw that through the um, some of the examples of the rubric. Thank you very much. Sure. Ms. Kraft, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, I was just gonna say that they look at it in totality. So they will look at the curriculum resources, which include uh, whatever um, textbook or curriculum we're using in addition to what we've created as an office, in addition to the alignment to the assessment <laughs> we're giving the students. And so they're looking not only at the coherence within the grade level, but between grade levels. So they're actually giving this really big picture of do we really provide a coherent program from K to five? So within grades and between grades. Thank you. Um, I raised my hand to make sure I was in order. Uh, my question to each of you uh, pertains to what we can expect when we get back this report. Um, I've heard that what you've said, Ms. Shea, Ms. Graft, about the, um, the programs, uh, the, uh, the materials, et cetera, just looking at whether we meet standards. Will this audit give us any understanding about whether the curriculum and or the various curriculum and the um, materials are actually working across system? Or is it going to just tell us, all right, it, you have everything in place and it's on paper, but we won't get a sense of whether in school A, B, C versus some other schools, whether the, the push out, the layout of it in those schools are really effective for them. I'm thinking about algebraism. Sure, right. it's, a, it's a great question. I'm sorry, Dr. McComas, were you gonna answer? Well, I yes, I was going to add to the answer, Ms. Shea, so thank you for letting me go first. Um, so, Ms. Sester, as always, I can see your uh, background as a, as a school instructional leader. So, what this will do for us is it will provide us a report at the end, just like we had um, in, from Johns Hopkins related to math. And it will uh, give us an analysis of the resources that we as a system have assembled and that we provide for teachers um, to access to, to provide uh, day in and day out instruction. It will identify for us areas that are have the coherence, are strongly aligned. It will identify soft spots that we need to improve and fix. You know, uh, when you think about the math, that was part of our work to then uh, bring on board highly rated resources in the form of bridges. Um, so it will give us as a system that type of report um, from which we will take action. I think your question is really more about implementation. So the audit will not be able to assess um, how we implement 
our curriculum, right? Because that's having a solid uh, curriculum is, is step one. Step two is, of course, implementing with fidelity, right? And so I think your question, and it, it to me, it bespeaks like, no, I'm, I'm not understanding your question. Oh, forgive me, Ms. Castro. I, I thought I understood the question. No, you did answer the question. However, what undergirds my question, you are now touching on. Obviously, I knew that what a, that audit did. But through experience, I also understand from having read results, paid attention to results, that I never saw or didn't. I'm going to just be honest. I never saw that it transferred into exactly what you're starting to say now, implementation, that anyone really took a good look at the findings and said, based on these findings and based on what we already know, we can look at, at data, what we already know. And we know that there is a disconnect between even what the state is saying, oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, you have it going on. And the system says, oh, yeah, you have it going on. And yet we know that we don't have it going on because we're still looking at schools that where there's, there's something wrong in terms of implementation or support where the curriculum and the materials are concerned. Right. So, uh, Ms. Pester, I would say, you know, in, in true form, you know, as always, implementation is internal work. Other outside organizations cannot really, um, I, I, I don't know how to say it. They can't fix that, right? That's on us to fix. And, and part of that work to support stronger implementation is validating um, the curriculum. It, it, step one, do we in fact have a strong curriculum? Step two, have we professionally developed our teachers so that they know how to leverage those resources in, in a research-based, evidence-based, best practice approach? Um, and then two, our accountability around implementation with fidelity is are the pieces that you're really getting at, which which makes sense to me because of, of again, your, your background. We all know having something on paper is one thing. Being able to bring it to life at a high quality day in and day out for each and every child is a whole nother ballgame, right? And this part of what we're discussing really touches on the first part. Do we know, in fact, the foundation is solid? And then from there, uh, we can continue to strengthen and improve our professional learning, which then translates into daily practice and monitoring uh, daily practice for implementation. I'm pleased to say and, while we're know, talking about ELA, we are in the process of all of that with Bridges. Absolutely. And, and you know, I like to ask a question just to put it out so I can stay in my what lane and not my how lane. <laughs> um, and we yes, do man. know that in, spring, in the spring, once uh, the findings are presented, um, if this piece of the conversation um, had not been laid out, we'd have Ms. Mack saying, then if it's good, then why, and she'll be right. We'll, Absolutely, we, right. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I was trying to be a what person and lay it out so that we can really reduce in the spring the amount of conversation we have, and it goes in sync with COMPASS. So thank you for, for uh, that and, and humoring us with that. I appreciate oh, that. Absolutely. I think Dr. Hager has a question as well. Um, yes, and I apologize if I missed this, but it sounds like the whole process is hinges on this MSD developed rubric and protocols for evaluating the curriculum. And so I assume we have those now ahead of time. Is that correct? We do. And they're also available on MSDE's website. So um, we have been given them and they're also publicly available. And how often are those, are they updated? I don't know that they are. I just know that they went through a process to develop them. I think they did revise them at least once after the first time they used it um, based on information that was shared when they went through the first district, which I think was Baltimore City, but Ms. Kraft can correct me if I'm wrong. Nope, um, but I don't know, to your point, Dr. Hagan, it's not my understanding that they are um, continuously updated. They're pretty and new in general. Yeah, right, yeah. that's what... That's what I was going to share, Dr. Hager. I believe the uh, revision in COMAR that sets forward um, this requirement around auditing curriculums is a fairly new COMAR adjustment. I think within the last, 
I, I don't even know that it's five years old. Um, at, at most, it's a five-year-old um, COMAR adjustment. And so MSDE then had a time frame to develop the rubrics. They started with ELA and math. They ultimately, over time, um, my understanding is they are um, will be developing rubrics uh, to support districts and auditing science and social studies as well. But my understanding, just as as Air Audit, we initially met with MSDE, uh, I think it was actually maybe the week of the shutdown, the emergency shutdown, everything got pushed back. And my understanding is that likewise, their development around science and social studies rubric have, you know, had an impact as well in terms of timeline. So this is a process that is fairly new um, at, at large, but they are available in the MSDE website. And is there a component of the protocol that includes an emphasis on cultural norms and looking at kind of cultural appropriateness of the content of the curriculum in ELA? I believe that MSDE is working on, um, a, I don't think that it's embedded in this rubric, but I do know that they are working on, I believe, resources to that end. Because we we know it's it's got to be we can and that makes me excited for our social studies pilot presentation. You know we'll be talking about where we as a system are working to ensure that our curriculum um, is culturally responsive and decidedly you know anti-racist in in advocating for uh, a, a culturally diverse community. I know you've been doing that work. I was just thinking if it was. So yeah, if it was, it was nice, you know, if it right. were. the intersectionality of that would be fantastic. I think MSD is is working in different rates, and I certainly don't think judgment of, of their process and work. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And we're doing well. So you are <laughs> brilliant, Dr. McComas. Brilliant, brilliant. No, it's no, it's it's a function of, you know, we have the best committee. <laughs> we have the best committee. Okay, thank I, you. I agree. Um, thank you. <laughs> I love our committee. Um, thank you. Our next presentation uh, will be uh, Mr. Embriali and Mr. Chauvinauer are joining us today. Um, one of the things I realized last year is, it, and this is actually, I realized this before we went into our emergency shutdown, but the emergency shutdown even more creates a sense of importance and urgency. Uh, here, I realized that part of helping all of you and helping all of our stakeholders understand digital learning resources um, is to be able to share with you different resources, what they are, how they're utilized, and what, you know, how do they serve our students and our curriculum um, standards, and how do they support teaching and learning? Because many, many of us grew up before the digital era in terms of instruction. And so these things are abstract and they're not concrete and experiential for us. And so we often as um, members and committees and on boards, we talk about these things abstractly. And because I am very committed to ensuring that each of you are, are well informed and understand uh, what is happening in our school system, I decided that we would try this year to provide um, you opportunity to learn about some of our digital resources. We certainly won't get through everything throughout the course of the year, but I'd like to begin a series on helping you see, know, and fully understand these many different resources that we have. And of course, our um, COVID context has made them even more uh, relevant than ever. So on that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Embriali and Mr. Stobenauer. Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh Dr. McComas did such a good job of uh, providing a, a wonderful introduction uh, that what I will say here uh, about this first slide is simply that we wanted to bring forward one of our tools today. So uh, Dr. McComas talked about resources and tools and this uh, the digital suite that we have in our ecosystem. Uh, and so, as she said, we're, we want to continually provide you information about those tools and resources that we have. And so today's tool that we're bringing forward is, is Wixi. Dave, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, as a reminder, there are a number of free or freemium resources available on the internet, and um, it's really thousands. So BCPS maintains subscription-based products really due to their reliability, um, 
the age appropriateness, our ability to work with our curriculum offices to uh, match those tools and resources to the appropriate age group, and the fact that they are 100% completely ad-free, uh, and that they provide to technical support and assistance that comes from the partnership with a provider, whoever that might be. So Wixi, like uh, all of our products, is available 24-7, um, and it's inside of the BCPS network. It is part of BCPS One, which means for our students and our teachers, it's seamless access. It's single sign-on, meaning you put in your username and password one time, and you're able to go into the product. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Stovenauer, and I'll be back in just a little bit. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Wixie is a uh, web-based creation software that's available for BCPS teachers and students in grades K through eight. And we've been using it in BCPS since 2015. Um, it's accessible to BCPS teachers and students in grades K through eight through the instructional and productivity tools section in BCPS one, and it's integrated into Schoology. Um, it's also integrated into our K-8 curriculum across disciplines as a way for students to demonstrate their understanding <clears throat> and collaborate with their teachers and fellow students. Uh, it works seamlessly in the Chrome browser and also provides additional enhanced functionality such as text-to-speech and real-time collaboration between students and teachers. Um, it's important to understand at the outset, um, as Mr. Imbriali alluded to, the difference between a resource and a tool um, in this context. So resources we consider to be those things that can provide curricular materials and content, while a tool such as Wixi um, is a software that can be used to manipulate content in some way, shape, or form. So Wixi is a tool. The tool is a solution for student group projects, small group differentiation, or even to use as an interactive white, whiteboard space. Um, our academic offices have integrated this um, to help deliver and interact with the curriculum. Um, it supports universal design for learning, which is uh, one of the focuses um, that we are doing with our professional learning um, through the Office of Organizational Effectiveness. Um, it allows for collaboration, provides a lot of student choice for how they evidence their learning, um, and it's become quite familiar to students at this point um, with the way that it functions. So uh, Wixie has been beneficial across the entire curriculum landscape. It's currently filled with templates for students and teachers to use that range from graphic organizers, um, art materials, science, STEM, social emotional lessons, language arts. Uh, in addition, curriculum offices and schools have saved projects and lesson pre plan presentations in Wixi that are timely and accurate and are directly tied to and embedded in various curricula. For example, the new Computer Science and Innovation Elementary curriculum contains materials for each grade level, as well as previous completed student collaborative projects. There are folders in Wixie for all areas of elementary and middle school courses, and I'm going to get into some of that in a little bit of a demo in a minute. Um, in our remote learning environment, Wixi has been essential in assisting our curriculum offices and specifically the Office of Elementary Math in providing curriculum materials to students in a format that is, that is accessible for editing, manipulation, and submission as evidence of learning. Uh, using the tools in Wixi, the office is able to upload PDF curricular materials from Bridges for students that would not be otherwise useful for learning in our current virtual learning environment. Um, this is a new function of Wixie that the vendor Tech for Learning um, has developed to assist us in this time. Um, they're now developing these tools to make this functionality available for all teachers inside the Wixie platform. Um, with that, I do want to show you, um, I hope that I'm going to need to change my sharing. So I apologize for one minute. While Dave is pulling this up, I did want to mention Wixie is a product that's been used since 2015. Wixie's predecessor was Pixie. Don't laugh. I know the names. Uh, but 
Pixie is a product that has actually been used in Baltimore County since 2005. So we've been partnering with Tech for Learning on a, on the the predecessor product and now the web based web based version since 2005. So uh, Wixie, again, as we've continually said, accessible through BCPS1, it's in the instructional tools tile. And when we go into Wixie, there we go. Come on. Okay, when we go into Wixi, you can see that students can save projects. We've got team projects, um, but I want to show a little bit down here in Baltimore County's public schools folders. So um, we were talking a little bit about the elementary math and the issues that they were having with PDF um, copies being sent to children and then children not being able to manipulate those. Um, and so what Wixi has helped us do is take that those resources from Bridges and put them into formats that are available for students. Unless, of course, with my children also online, I'm having trouble with my Wi-Fi, so I apologize. Here we go. So this previously was a PDF document. So what we would run into in the spring was um, teachers would send this and then families would have to either print it out or find a program online to help manipulate it. But now they, we can put it in Wixi. It's available to students to be able to manipulate in, in a variety of ways. The instructions over here on the right-hand side are text-to-speech. So if you hit the play button, it will read those directions. Uh, when a student receives this, these are active buttons that the kid the child can record their voice, stop the recording, play it back, and share it. Um, they can manipulate different parts of the um, activities that would come up in these pages, again, that would previously be inaccessible. Um, so if they have a Chromebook and it has a touch screen, they could use their finger to write the number four inside of this screen and then save it back as a project. So that, that's one use that we've found. Another use that I wanna show you um, is in our social studies curriculum. And what we're looking at is a way that we can create collaborative tools. Um, and I think this is, where, um, this is where a lot of the, shall we say, bang for the buck can be with Wixi, because now you can put multiple students into a project um, and they can collaborate in a variety of ways using the tool um, so that, especially in this, um, in this remote learning environment, we, we run into times when students can't collaborate as well as sitting around a table together. But they need this time to be able to work together to create something, to be able to post it somewhere and then share it with their teacher to demonstrate their learning. So that is a quick, um, a very quick, uh, a demonstration of kind of where we are with Wixie and what benefits it can offer to us. So I'm going to um, pull this down and uh, go back to the PowerPoint quick. So Ryan, uh, Mr. Imbriali, if you wanna. And I apologize, sure. let me let me reshare so I can get this correct. I, if you wanna get started, Ryan. I will get started. So the slide that Dave is uh, about to bring up is how often students use Wixi. And, and so you can look at the historical and the, and the, and the current year here. So 18, 19, and then uh, 19 and 20. And you can see uh, that there was a tremendous increase in terms of visits and projects during the 2019-2020 um, school year last year. As uh, we were going into remote learning, this product became uh, that much more important for us. So uh, just to define a visit versus a project, a visit occurs when a student is given the opportunity to view a document or project in Wixie. Um, and this can be an opportunity for collaboration with a fellow student. Dave showed a little bit about that, or to respond to a task that has been assigned by the teacher. A project um, can be either teacher or student created, and that's where you're sharing it for a large collaborative project. So multiple students are coming in to work together to develop something and then share that project with the teacher. So Dave, can you go to the next slide? 
So this is a chart, a chart that shows that shows our usage since the beginning of April um, uh, of last year, and it, it demonstrates the importance of the tool uh, during remote learning. You can see uh, that there was a significant increase in during that time um, as uh, the opportunity for collaboration outside of a physical environment became uh, so important, and this and this tool, Wixie, provided that opportunity uh, for that collaboration to occur in a remote setting. And I think the next slide is uh, just questions. So we're we're uh, between Mr. Sovenauer and I. We're happy to take any questions that you might have regarding um, Wixie. Dr. Hager, then Ms. Mack. And hey. thank you very much for the presentation, gentlemen. Dr. Hager? Yes, I echo uh, the thank you for the presentation. Um, as a parent, I have, uh, I'm very, very familiar with Wixi, and um, I've had the same question from the first day I looked at it, and that is why not use PowerPoint or Google Slides versus Wixi? So what can Wixi do that is, um, that is superior to that, given that after eighth grade, I'm sure students transition to using PowerPoint. Many teachers are coming into the school system from college or you know, in, entering into their teaching, not being familiar with Wixie, but instead being quite familiar with PowerPoint. So I've never, never, quite, never quite understood that. So, um, but I'll, I'll talk about the first piece of that. The first piece of that is the resource library that, that Dave was showing you on the left-hand side. So the ability for all of our academic offices to upload those resources that exist by unit, by subject area, by content, um, it gives those academic offices a tremendous amount of flexibility. On the back end, there are um, abilities for multiple adults to connect to develop resources, to be able to put those resources in there. And um, PowerPoint, those kind of products, Google Slides, do have a lot of that um, ability. Uh, we have this huge sort of war chest now of resources that have been built out uh, using Wixie. And especially for our primary grade students, uh, Wixie is a great start to that interaction. Um, and um, and the other piece that's important is this kind of partnership like we're seeing with with what we're being able to do with Bridges. That's, that's something that we would have not been able to do with Google Slides or with uh, PowerPoint right now. And it's it's been a huge crutch to us. So the opportunity to connect with that um, organization sort of on a one-to-one -one basis and try to figure out a solution and then allow them to work with one of our um, vendor partners. Um, and uh, uh, Ms. Shea would know the name of the company who provides bridges. I'm, I'm just blanking on who that is. But they were able to connect those dots, work collaboratively, and find a solution. That can be pretty difficult with an organization like Microsoft or Google. So um, that benefit has really helped us in this particular scenario. And so all and of that content that we've loaded onto Wixi, do we own that or by loading it onto their, their platform, if we were to end our contract, could we recover that content or is it their property? It's ours. It, all of that is our property. So we would be able to recover that, that all, all of that property. Well, I also, it's the Math Learning Center is the name of the publisher for the math. So technically most of that content is the Math Learning Centers, but they were in partnership with mm -hmm. Wixie and us to allow us to transform it into a way that made it um, easily engaged with by our students and the teachers. Thank you. Sure. Thank you both for, for uh, the answers. Uh, Ms. Mack and then Mr. Offerman. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Embriali. I've heard about Wixie. I hear a lot of teachers talking about it. And I think my question is maybe not specifically about Wixie, but once children are in there, I know that teachers are using it with great success and the kids like it. But the feedback that I'm getting is with our youngest learners, the steps to get to any of these tools are proving quite challenging. And I'm most concerned about our youngest learners um, who don't have somebody at home with them to step them through, you know, how to get to it. Mr. Stovenauer stepped through it very quickly because obviously he's used to doing it. He's an adult. But I had a lot of teachers say to me, I'll start a lesson. And by the time I have stepped every student through getting into the tool, the time is over. Is there any way, are we looking at ways to 
simplify the process for accessing these tools while we're in a virtual environment? So uh, I'll see if Mr. Stovenero has a, an additional response right. to that. But first of all, I, I want to acknowledge teachers' concerns around that, that uh, we as well want everything to be as seamless as possible and as few steps as possible. Um, I, I will say we're working with Schoology, which is our learning management system, as everyone knows. Um, they are uh, fast tracking and, and timelines are obviously all messed up with everything that's going on with virtual learning and all these companies working on this. But they, um, they do have a timeline for launching a primary grade view of the learning management system, which would change what it would look like for our primary age uh, students in our elementary schools. That would be a benefit because it would present itself in a much more... Um, framed look so it's much easier for students to move around. That doesn't then answer the question about still get to, getting to another product, how easy and seamless that can be. Um, I, I, want, I wonder if Mr. Stovenauer might be able to comment on the professional development that we provide to teachers uh, and how we try to help with that connection. You, you, you stole some of my thunder there, Mr. <laughs> Imbriali, so about the primary view. But um, I will say a lot of the professional development that we've engaged with recently in the Schoology environment is about how to build pages for how for how for teachers to build pages and embed those materials directly into the lesson view that the students are seeing. So they eliminate some of that searching and poking around trying to find the correct way in um, instead of going to the, the resources tab in Schoology, just having the teacher embed that link into the lesson. And that's a lot of where the work we're doing to try to simplify some of that for students is coming. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, again, I, I have heard um, after the first couple of days, I have to be honest, I've heard it was pretty rough and my phone was ringing off the hook, but then it somewhat normalized um, and parents were less frantic and teachers were less frantic, but I have had teachers continue to say to me, by the time I get all of my students where they need to be, the time's up. So I am happy to hear that we're looking at a way to do that. Well, I, I will say this, oh. I will say this publicly along with Mr. Stovenauer, we have lots of resources that we've been at, we've built out to help support teachers in exactly what you're talking about, Ms. Mack. And if there's something else we need to build out, we will. So mm -hmm. any of those teachers who have questions or concerns or need additional supports, we have a team of resource teachers um, and ourselves who are ready to help them, and we will. And I have been pretty much, um, as I get information from something that worked for one teacher, I send it out to the teachers with whom I've had conversations, but I will direct them to you. Thank you. And, and if I could if I could make a shameless plug for my resource teachers, they are doing um, office hours. They've been doing all this week and, and all next week just to do a Q&A. So it's a Microsoft Teams link. Any teacher can come in. There's no presentation. It's you're having an ed tech issue. Come ask us that question. And then we're also taking that information back and trying to develop more materials that, that we can put um, and make available for, for everyone. Yeah, and let me clarify, I would not, what I'm referencing, I wouldn't call an ed tech issue, but just the fact that there are better ways potentially to do things that a teacher may be unaware of. Um, right, there's, there's best practices that practitioners develop as they, they go on the tricks of the trade that help. Right, right. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I, um, I just want to remind everybody we only have 20 minutes left, and I know we want to get to our social studies curriculum, so I don't want to cut off the conversation. I never really want to cut that off. Um, I think Mr. Offerman may have had a quick question, or maybe... Yes, he did. His hand's been up. Yes. And then Mr. Offerman? Uh, I, I, I will forward my question to Mr. Embriali via, uh, via email later. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Happy to share, uh, happy to answer the question, Mr. Offerman. Um, thank you, everyone. And I do hope that our series of bringing forward um, instructional digital resources will be helpful and formative for all of you so that uh, we take away sort of like sort of the uh, unforeseen, you know, when you don't see and feel and touch a resource, it's difficult to really have an understanding of, of its purpose and how it serves to support uh, teaching and learning. On this, I'd like to uh, quickly uh, ask Ms. Shea, Mr. Billingsley, who's our Director of Social Studies, and Dr. Bianconi, who's our coordinator, 
for um, secondary social studies to come forward and um, to you um, our eighth grade social studies pilot. Um, and this tags along with the resources that we came to you in August and asked for uh, support around purchasing supplemental text to go with the, the pilot. And um, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dr. McComas. And I'm short on time. I want to make sure I get you to the good stuff, um, which is the social studies office. And of course, our teacher who's here joining us. So next slide. Um, I do want to take a moment to introduce, um, because as we were talking about this work, and Dr. Hagar, I want to thank you, because if you remember, as Dr. McComas said at our last meeting, when we um, did seek and get approval from all of you, um, thankfully, to um, integrate Stamped by Jason Reynolds and Imbram Kendi into our curriculum, we had talked about this pilot, and, and um, you had actually asked for more information. So thank you, because that gave us a window. And I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce Ms. Brianna Ross. Uh, she is the Social Studies Department Chair at Deer Park, Middle Magnet School, and she was also one of the lead curriculum writers. So today, as we're sharing some of the pilot um, of the curriculum itself, but then also the process, uh, Ms. Ross is going to be a critical voice um, in really sharing that authentic experience. And we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for all of you to hear right from the classroom. So she'll be speaking in just a moment, um, but I wanted you to know she was here. Next slide, Mr. Corns. And so I wanted to quickly talk a little bit about the background, although I'm sure as this committee knows, and as we talked about last time, it probably needs no um, introduction. But there, it's always important for us as we talk about curriculum changes that we put it in the larger context of our why. And so we know that as our um, the students we serve and our population is shifting, we have to be sure that we're addressing the challenging needs of ensuring that our curriculum authentically reflects, reflects the students that we serve. Um, we know that we have to shift our mindset around understanding achievement gaps to the concept of an education debt. In other words, how are we ensuring that our um, curriculum is both anti-racist and culturally responsive to ensure that equal opportunity and access for success? Um, and much of that work will come from being really intentional about implementing both culturally relevant pedagogy and by ensuring we have anti-racist curriculum. And lest you think I skipped it, the most important part of our why is our students. So our students are on the front lines. And as we've heard um, throughout, but most recently with an increased sense of urgency this summer, our students are on the front lines of anti-racist activism, and they're demanding for us to be different and change with NBCPS, and they're right. And so in response to the voices of our students and to the needs that we know we have to support our students, we have taken very deliberate action um, to transfer our equity theory into practice. And, and speaking of our equity theory, it's very timely for me, um, based on Tuesday evening and the report both that the equity committee had heard and then that Dr. Lisa Williams was able to share again on Tuesday evening. Um, that's another part of our why. Our data tells us that we know we need to do things differently, that we have to ensure that um, our curriculum is serving that purpose. Next slide. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Ms. Brianna Ross so she can talk a little bit about the curriculum process and specifically how our student voices were centered in that work. Ms. Ross? Yeah, thank you so much, Megan. Um, and Ms. Shea made some really, really wonderful points, but I think the most salient one is that we know that when, what we do, we show up every day for our students and they are at the core of all of our work. And so this summer, we really wanted to make sure that we kept them at the center, that they were our focus. And so we had this beautiful opportunity to have a panel of students come, um, or not come virtually. We got to talk to a panel of about 12 students from around the county. Um, most of them had just graduated eighth grade, so they were fresh off this US, this American history curriculum. Um, and we talked to them about what are what are they, what do they want to see from social studies instruction? What do they want to see their teachers doing? Um, and what are what we really got from them is that they are craving a more inclusive and a more equitable curriculum that is reflective not only of not only of who they are, but of the people around them and the world around them. And they really, really wanted to see that. Um, and they were incredibly insightful. And I just have a quote that I wanted to share because it was so powerful from one of our students. Um, and she had typed this on the padlet we were using. And she said, 
Change within the curriculum will allow those difficult and uncomfortable conversations to occur. I hope that these changes will further educate everyone about the real struggles that Indigenous groups face throughout history. I believe that the changes in the curriculum will make students more empathetic towards the injustices around the world. And hopefully, it will encourage people to not turn a blind eye to these injustices. Education is the real gateway to change, and these changes will hopefully ignite others to use their voices and speak out against injustices. Um, and I don't know if I can say it better than she did. Um, they want to have the conversations. They, they're they living in it right now. They, they want to talk about what's going on, um, and they want to use their voices to make change. And I think what I, what I really took from that conversation with those students is that they are ready to mobilize, they are eager to learn, um, and they want to take action. And I think for us as educators, um, for us to do anything outside of providing them the content knowledge, but also the tools to go ahead and advocate for themselves and others would be a disservice to them. So we have this really unique opportunity. And so our students really drove um, everything that you guys will see in the curriculum today. And we can go to the next one. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Um... And I agree, the students pretty much always say it better, as do our teachers. <laughs> Next slide, Mr. Corns. And so that what the next slide will show is as soon as it advances, there we go. Um, just to refresh your memory, as Dr. McComas um, reminded us, last time we were together in August, um, we did seek and get very gratefully approval to um, utilize this text, Stamped Racism, Anti-Racism in You by Jason Reynolds and Ember Max Kendi. Um, and just to ensure that um, we refrain, reframe that we did have that um, selection committee that was comprised of parents, students, teachers, and stakeholders outli as outlined in policy and rule 6002 but the um, important thing there is to know that um, everyone that participated on this committee um, echoed this idea of a sense of urgency and how critically important it was to explore the multiple perspectives. But as you also heard Ms. Ross um, share, it's also about connecting it to students' sense of civic action. And that is also an important part of our social studies curriculum. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Billingsley as we transition to the next slide, just to talk about the larger context, because it's important that we understand as grateful as we are for the approval of an individual text, we know that um, just buying a new book isn't going to shift the practice. So we have to be really deliberate in that design. Next slide, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Billingsley. Thank you, Megan. Um, and so th this is important to understand that this isn't the first work that social studies done. We have to go back in time. Um, and you'll remember two years ago when we constructed the K through 12 financial literacy framework. Um, and some people think it's, that's financial literacy, but that really is part of our equity work um, as we begin to address the income and wealth disparities that exist um, nationally, but specifically within our community. Um, so building on that, we move forward a year. We've been working around the importance of social justice and giving voice to our students around civic action. Um, we introduce in grade eight and an American government uh, BCPS project soapbox um, where kids identified and researched a socio-political topic um, that was of that they felt was significant or interest to them in their community. They then developed and were going to deliver up until COVID um, a, a, a persuasive speech to community stakeholders. And I just say that because I want to set the context that this is a continuation of the work. Um, and I'll say where, show where it kind of fits in um, with what we called um, our BCPS Civic. And this is a draft version says citizenship, but is actually our BC, BCPS civic engagement framework. And this is specific for grade eight. And when we when we developed this framework, we got to think the idea of three terms and that's civic understanding, civic voice, and civic action as we move our students along this trajectory. Mr. Corns, if you can advance the slide. So when we talk about civic action, um, first we need to define what it is, and as, as it appears in terms of understanding, it's students and stakeholders develop a basic understanding of the local, state, and national government, and the foundations to drive the American political landscape. Now, what that term means in terms of a student outcome is both the understanding of our national and, and government structures and functions, but this is the critical piece in the change around our anti-racist work. With, with surrounding context of whose voices were and were not included, leading to the legacy of racist, of that racist hierarchy. And that's kind of the transition that we're looking through as we, we advance our curriculum. If we advance again, Mr. Corns, from civic understanding um, to civic voice, excuse me. So in this, we're, we're really looking at and helping kids develop the capacity 
and the skills to take informed action as they construct arguments and expl exp um, explanations and synthesize that, ev ev um, that evidence into some sort of position on an issue. They're really not taking an issue, I mean, taking action at this point, but they're right up to that to that edge. Um, and so by eighth grade, the inclusion of those additional voices and perspectives um, that were historically excluded are now brought in and gives students a broader range as they develop and develop their own participatory um, voice in, in the democratic process. The final component then we want to get to is that civic action component. And so at this point, we're hoping that we, at this time, it's also been carries outside of the schoolhouse, but it prepares kids to become um, become active participants in both our local, state, and sometimes national landscape as they apply the understanding and the voice that they've developed. <clears throat> and so we hope by the end of eighth grade, the students will be, have identified that issue that is a con concern to them and then begin to a, um, advocate and influence um, various grassroots organizations in order to begin implementing that change, as we've seen in Randallstown and Catonsville and Hereford High School students um, really taking that action. And that brings us to where we are today. Over the course of the summer, we can advance the screen, we began looking at our doing a, a, an equity audit of our eighth grade curriculum. Mr. Corns, if you can advance the screen. Um, an anti-racist audit. And so we brought together a group of, um, of teachers, uh, really led by um, Dr. Biancoli, our coordinator. We had teachers brought in from around the county. Um, if we can advance one more slide. So we had the BCPS office, we had the um, equity office, um, uh, Jen Audlin and Dominic Smith, who were wonderful partners in this work. Um, we brought in our, um, our middle school teachers. Um, Brianna Ross was a fantastic leader in that process. And we also brought in a third party, and that's Dr. Um, Stephanie Flores Coolish from the um, Loyola University. She's been doing a lot of social justice work with our teachers prior to this time, but in this process, she kind of acted as the lead facilitator in conjunction with the office to really leave, to lead and drive this work. And where we got started was we needed a process, and something that was shared with us um, by Ms. Shea earlier was the, cult the culturally responsive scorecard. We can advance the slide, Mr. Corns. And at this point, I'll let Dr. Biancoli pick up and explain how we use the scorecard and how we conducted the audit. Dr. Biancoli? Sure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Corns, if you can just advance that one more. Um, so we divided our work really into two weeks. And the first week was really to take the critical look at our curriculum. And then the second week was kind of now that we've identified areas um, of need, we looked at how to fix them. And in looking at the tool from um, NYU Center for Research on Equity and Transformation in Schools, we picked out the two parts that really applied to social studies. And we looked at the social justice component, so things like decolonization, power, and privilege, centering that multiple perspectives piece and connecting to real life, and evaluating our eighth grade curriculum on those pieces as well as the teacher materials that were provided. And we asked our group of teachers to go through our eighth grade curriculum and really uh, examine it and give it a score. Uh, if you could go to the, the next slide, Mr. Corns. And when they did this and they, they looked at that social justice piece, and you can actually go to the next slide because I talk through this piece. The other, as I said, the teacher materials component is really what is what we are providing teachers to help them be able to do this. And next slide. I want to get us to, to Ms. Ross so she could give us the specifics. One of the things that they found in terms of looking at our curriculum is that while we are trying to do things, um, we're not doing it good enough. So I'm going to let Brianna give you a sense of some of those very specific examples that they found for both Units 1 and Unit 4, um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about what we did in Week 2. So Brianna, if you'd like to... Uh... Yep, um, and we're on the right track, Danny. So we have some work to do, but we're on the right track. <laughs> um, but looking at Unit 1, so a lot of our discoveries were related to the lack of varied perspectives, and we do do some work in the 8th grade curriculum um, at looking at African Americans, at women, at Native Americans, but a lot of what our students understand about them um, is from a deficit-based perspective, and we really want to shift that and look at these non-dominant populations from an asset-based perspective, 
and making sure that we tie that in, not just in one or two lessons, but really doing that throughout the unit. Um, we talked a lot about the Declaration of Independence um, and looking at that document, and it's a beautiful document that really outlines what was almost sort of seen as this like utopian kind of government and the language of both justice and equality is so strong in that document and so powerful. Um, and yet we know who was completely left out of that narrative. And so what we want our students to be able to think about is what does this indicate about how those the writers of that document, how the founders of the country really saw the humanity or lack thereof um, of people of color, particularly our Black and Native Americans. So thinking about um, the hypocrisy in that document and how they were founding a country but yet denying groups of people so many rights in, in such a systematic way. Um, and then sort of the one of the other really big pieces for unit one for us was looking at the language and really thinking about how our vocabulary choices shape how we construct meaning um, around historical events. So one in particular that really stuck out to us was the use of this word rebellion. And we see it a lot come up in unit one. Um, and in particular, there's an event, Pontiac's Rebellion, and it's the name that historians have given to this event. Um, and the, the definition of the word is to resist authority or control. And so what we want our students to think about and we want our curriculum to do an outline for teachers is what makes someone an, an authority who has the right to call themselves an authority is this an appropriate term for this sort of for this sort of act or uprising is it really a rebellion um, and who gets to determine who is in power so we want to look at both language and make sure that we're being more inclusive of those non-dominant populations um, and then we can go to the next one and look at unit four which is when we get to our Civil War and Reconstruction. And so I'm just going to look at this a little bit from the teacher side. So one of the things that we saw and a big concern for us that we saw across all units um, is that our curriculum writers are phenomenal and they give us beautiful and wonderful resources of varying media types. But one of our bigger concerns is that there is nothing in our curriculum that teaches teachers how to talk about these difficult topics that our students want to engage in and that they want to learn about. And I can understand that from a teacher perspective of not knowing, is this the right thing to say? Am I going to offend anybody? How do I have this conversation? Is this too much? Is it not enough? And so we want our curriculum to do a better job at doing that. How can we address teacher bias? How can we teach teachers how to do this? How can we model it for them? Um, even how can we incorporate students and backgrounds in a way that feels really authentic. So we want to sort of focus on how we can do a better job at supporting our teachers. Um, and I, I'm going to speak for the Office of Social Studies, and I think I can do that, John and Danny, if that's OK, and say that um, I think it's our goal that through our instruction that we help cultivate students who are civically engaged and who know how to use their agency and their voices to advocate for themselves. And so a big piece for us, and John mentioned this about this civic engagement, and we have some awesome schools and teachers who have been doing Project Soapbox, um, but we want all of our teachers to really know how do we get our students to move from just the learning phase to now doing? How do we get them into action and what do we do? Um, and so one of our big pieces and big conversations was around role play activities, and that was a fun talking point for us this summer. We have lots of activities in our curriculum that are, imagine you're a colonist or imagine you're an, an immigrant, um, but we want to sort of reverse that and move away from put yourself in their shoes to putting history into the current context, um, and especially right now, because we are in our shoes right now. This is We are living in the history, um, and our students are experiencing, experiencing the world in a really, really visceral way, especially with the combination of technology and information that they have. And so we want to move away from the role play and really move into how can we connect what our students are learning in class to the social, political, and environmental issues and movements that are happening today? Because we want them to not only have the historical context, but also the inquiry skills, the analysis skills, and the advocacy skills to then say, now I know how to go and tackle these issues and face them head on. So we want to make sure that we're giving our teachers support for how they move students into that next phase. I um, mean, we can go to the next one. Okay, and I know that we are short on time, so uh, just, and Brianna did a, a beautiful job of kind of outlining some of those next steps that we worked at um, in week two, where we really said, okay, now that we've identified the areas of need, how do we fix them? And one of the first ways that we were doing that was the integration and the use of stamps. But then the other piece is sort of a, um, a reimagining of how we go about talking about American history so that it does take an inquiry approach and we're presenting students with those multiple perspectives. We're integrating that narrative and those multiple narratives from the ground up. 
um, and helping students to interrogate primary sources and create meaning. So if you can go to the next slide. We're doing that through something called the inquiry design model or an IDM, which is really aligned around those meaty questions that get students thinking, those primary sources that help them to examine those varied viewpoints and to create that meaning, and then being able to synthesize that to draw conclusions and then to extend it into um, either outside of the classroom or something into uh, real life that would provide that real life connection for students. Um, and if we have time, I know Brianna has an example of what one of those questions would sound like. Do we have time? I, I think if, if okay. you would go ahead, uh, Ms. Ross, and share, I do. we do need to be mindful because there is a committee coming behind us, uh, but I would like you to share one of these questions quickly. Absolutely. So I'll let was whose destiny is being manifested um, to sort of get them to think about all the other perspectives of this issue. And then we have four supporting questions. What impact did Andrew Jackson have on Native American culture? How did manifest destiny engender the need for slavery? How did Christianity fuel the desire for westward expansion? And then how is manifest destiny a function of white supremacy? And I do just want to say there, this is all of our IDMs, but this one was a really good place. We pulled out lots of good sections from Stamped that really talk about how race um, and the ideas around race are sort of constructed. And so we we were able to align Stamped with the IDM. And then the action piece that we included was for to have students look at the issue around the Standing Rock Tribe um, in South Dakota with the Dakota Access Pipeline and sort of do some comparisons between the Sioux tribe and then what the Native Americans um, during specifically during the Trail of Tears what they were experiencing and we can go to the next one so um, I will just say we, we talked about this I know we're short on time so if you just want to advance Mr. Corns till you get to the uh, the next steps piece I think John will just take it from there oh, Dr. Wynn. perfect thank you um, First of all, we have remarkable teachers. Every time I hear Ms. Ross speak, I, I'm blessed um, that she's in social studies. <laughs> um, so what are our next steps? So right now we're in the process of revising our, those curricular lessons based on the audit findings. That work is starting underway um, as we speak. We are in the process of collaborating with advanced academics for the development of lessons to support the stamped integration. Um, that work actually started this week as well. Uh, we're also collaborating with the Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency in the development of PD to support schools, both teachers and administrations, because this is a two-pronged approach, because we know there's there's going to um, be some questions and stuff that, that the community has, um, that teachers have around this work, and we want to make sure we're well-equipped um, to advance it. And then finally, we are in the process of piloting um, these curricular revisions in eighth grade in um, Dunbarton Middle School, Deer Park, Middle School, Pikesville, Northwest Academy, and Lock Raven uh, Technical Academy. And so that's where we currently stand um, with our next steps. I think we're ready to answer any yes. questions that you might have. So um, thank you. I want to take a moment to thank um, John Billingsley and Danny Biancoli and certainly Brianna Ross for joining us. Um, and also thank you, committee, for the time. As you can hear, everybody's very passionate about this work and excited <laughs> about the work. So we're grateful for the time to share. And we'll certainly take any questions you have for any of us. All right, uh, thank you so much for that. I see Ms. Mack's hand up. I did let Ms. Scott know that we would we are over. Obviously, we would just be in in the next five minutes. Um, I, I just want to say as an educator and an English teacher just how much this particular uh, curriculum is going to impact on the other areas I can see, and the big piece being that you didn't try to extract. You are keeping what's in, but guiding students to how to embrace what is in and the inequities and, and how to talk about it in present time and to move that them. And I can see that with so much of our literature. Um, so thank you. Uh, Ms. Mack. 
Um, yes, thank you. And um, thank you, everyone, for putting this together. It was very, very insightful. The question I have, when I taught at CCBC, I would often put out topics for my students to discuss and then write about. And I quickly realized, or I guess I've realized my whole life, that people look at things through the lens of their lives. And I'm wondering how we are preparing teachers to um, talk about topics like this where students may come into a classroom having an understanding that is different. Their, their understandings are different from each other um, and their perspective of how something happened would be different. I, I, I imagine it could be very um, ch a very charged environment. And do we prepare our teachers for that? Yeah, it's a great question, Ms. Mack. Thank you for the question. And Ms. Pestro, thank you for your positive feedback as well. Um, we could probably do a whole session on that because I know we're so interested in time, but it's a really, really important question, Ms. Mack, because without that kind of support, unfortunately, sometimes teachers are afraid to have the conversation. And I think that's what we were hearing from students, that they were seeking the opportunity to have it. And so it's really critical that we provide um, that professional learning and those opportunities for those um, courageous conversations. So we're fortunate to partner with our equity office so we can build upon the foundations that they have laid through the equity work that we've been doing for many years, but then also partnering with them, be able to figure out how do we provide um, our teachers with, first of all, their own background knowledge, because what we also talked about with some of the teachers that were on this curriculum writing team, we sort of had a parallel conversation as we would write something, what the teachers were also identifying is, so what's going to be important for us to support about this? Or what is the information in this that some of our social studies educators also did not have because they were taught in a very Eurocentric perspective as well. So you have to also honor not just lived experience, but how has some of our own educational experience been somewhat myopic in its approach and how important it's gonna to be to create a condition. Um, so I think it, it also speaks to not only our equity work, but our work around social emotional learning and how do you create a classroom in which multiple perspectives, every student sees themselves as being valued and honored. So, so there's many, many layers and we're fortunate to be able to work collaboratively with, um, like I said, Dr. Williams and her team in the Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, our phenomenal social studies teachers, our administrators, um, and also with our um, school climate and safety team so that it can really be a multifaceted approach to not only supporting our teachers so they're comfortable navigating what can be a very emotionally charged um, many topics. Um, and so the best literature is provocative in that it gets people to think and, and have those emotions. So we don't want to shy away from that, but rather we want to center that so we can ensure we can explore these multiple perspectives, but in a way that doesn't cause further trauma. So you really hit the nail on the head of what our work is going forward. Um, but really the, the best answer I can give you is that it has to be a multifaceted and really continuous approach to do that. Right, I was just going to say um, um, that it that is ongoing, Ms. Mack. I, I appreciate your, your conversation because it really kind of, in many ways, goes back to uh, Ms. Pasteur's question way back around implementation, right? To support our teachers well in implementation, we need to support our teachers, right? Um, in addition to resources. so. Um, I do also need to remind us it is 409. I know we've got um, more questions because this is a, a, a worthy, worthy um, topic. We do, but we do have um, to respect uh, the next uh, committee. So I'm going to suggest that committee members send questions to you, Dr. McComas. And if we need to, we can adjust our uh, next meeting so that we can talk more about this because it is exciting and it does have some far reaching implications in terms of the other things we do in this system. Thank you, we would love that. <laughs> Wonderful. That being said, and looking at the time I'm going to ask for a motion to uh, adjourn this meeting, please. So moved, Mac. Thank you, Ms. Mac. Second, please. Second, Aaron Hager. Thank you, Dr. Hager. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for your time today.